Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're just waiting a few more seconds because I know that we did have a lot of attendees say that they were interested in joining this afternoon's session. Uh, my name is Shanna Smith. I'm the Director of State Advocacy and Alliance Development for USP Foundation. And I'm just gonna wait about 30 more seconds and then we'll begin. Okay, for those of you just joining us, we were just waiting a few more seconds um, for some last minute attendees to join us because we did have um, a lot of people that were interested in this topic. Um, for those of you who did not hear, my name is Shana Smith. I'm the Director of State Advocacy and Alliance Development for US Pain Foundation. And I just wanna thank you all for taking a little bit of time this afternoon to learn the power of social media and really some uh, ways that you can amplify some key messages and reach out to your state and federal legislators online. Now, before we get started, I wanna do a quick little audio and visual test. Um, and I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me clearly and that everyone can see my screen. If you can hear and or see me, please type in yes uh, using the questions button. You'll see a little question mark there where you can type in a question and I'll be able to see it. All right, everyone. Yes, yes, yep. Okay, great. That is perfect. Um, and congratulations for those of you who haven't been on a webinar before. This is how you're going to ask me questions at the end of the presentation. You're going to use that question um, button. And at the end, I'm going to monitor and, and try and answer as many questions as possible. Feel free to ask questions during the presentation as well, in case there's something um, that you don't want to forget about asking at the end. Uh, just note that I won't be able to answer those questions until the end of the presentation. All right, so today we're going to take a look at how you can maximize your efforts on social media. Or if you haven't already dabbled on Twitter or Facebook for patient advocacy purposes, I'm going to show you how you can effectively engage with policymakers and inspire some other Americans with chronic conditions to get involved. So the first question that I'm going to ask you all is what is social media? And what do I mean when I when I talk about social media? It's a phrase that I know a lot of us throw around a lot these days, but in its simple form, this term is referring to websites or applications that's allowing users to create and share content or participate in social networking. So when I say social, that's interacting with other people by sharing information and receiving information. And the media, of course, is an instrument of communication such as the internet. Of course, TV, radio, and newspapers are examples of some more traditional media. We're not going to get into that today. Our focus is mainly social media. And then some examples of what platforms we're speaking of specifically when we talk about social media, that would include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, LinkedIn, you name it. There are so many out there right now. I'm sure it's difficult for some of you to even keep up with, every, I know it's hard for me to even keep up with what is out there these days. Um, I have a younger sister and she's asking me about all these different platforms and I just, I can't keep up with it. So my go-to for social media advocacy is Twitter and Facebook. Okay, social media as an advocacy tool. So you're going to see on this slide the number of adults that are currently using social networking sites like Twitter and Facebook or Instagram and some other platforms. And that's a, a huge number. 73% of all US adults on the internet are using these social networking sites. Now the second bullet is showing us that 23% of Facebook users are checking that site at least five times or more on a daily basis. Um, luckily, I, for all of you, this is a virtual presentation, or I would say, show of hands, how many of us are using social media at least five times per day? 
And don't feel guilty about it because a lot of people are using this platform to get information. And now that everything's at our fingertips, a lot of Americans are changing the way that they're receiving their information or their news. So 43% of users are saying that they learn about more political or social issues because of something that they saw online. So you can see that the trend here as to how much of an impact these platforms can have. It's amazing. So of those who use social media for personal reasons, 28% of the users support a health-related cause, and Facebook users are two and a half times more likely to attend a political event or rally. And now just to give you an idea of how social media can play a historic role for this country, in Senate races, the candidate with the most Facebook friends than his or her opponent won 81% of the time. Now, Facebook has also proven influential with getting more people to the polls. We saw 75% of its users being more likely to persuade a friend or a coworker to vote. So why should we use social media when we are advocating for the chronic pain community? Well, for one, it is mobilizing supporters. So this can include the facilitation of coalition building, which can play a significant role when we're looking to move a bill forward within a state. And of course, the more individuals and groups that are participating and getting behind a cause, the better. It also facilitates some civic engagement and collective action. So again, this just allows the pain community as a whole to see what U.S. Pain Foundation as an organization is interested in, what our priority issues are at the moment, and hopefully creating some lasting relationships with coalitions or individuals who will stand behind our organization's mission and state advocacy efforts in the future. It also creates a way for us to interact with a large audience at once. And finally, it attracts attention. So meaning it is bringing to light our priority issues or your priority issues that may otherwise be ignored or lost by traditional media. Now, there are three communicative functions of social media, and the first is information, and that covers our posts, which go into detailed information about our activities and highlights from events or gatherings, as well as other news or reports relevant to stakeholders. It also um, relates to our community. So these are posts that are intended to create conversations. We can interact, we can share, and we can like things with lawmakers and fellow pain warriors. And the third communicative function is action, right? So this would cover posts that are intended to captivate the masses to actually do something. So whether that be through an advocacy campaign at a large scale or a state specific campaign aimed at gathering the attention of a committee and or an elected official. Just briefly, this is our social media strategy as an organization. We start by creating an objective. So we narrow down the goals, whether that be by publicizing an event, if we're looking to increase our visibility and reach for an awareness campaign, or if there's an advocacy call to action. Now this includes planning the audience that we want to reach and defining our messaging. So we basically do all of this work for our volunteers behind the scenes. So really all you would have to do is to like, share, retweet, or quote those tweets so that others can see our initial message. And in that way, social media is also ideal for those with chronic pain, right? Because it's providing a quick and easy way for us all to advocate from home. This is especially important for many of us who may suddenly have a flare up, uh, whether it be of pain or some other symptoms. You know, we had all the best intentions to get involved and to engage in something. And last minute, you know, we're just really not feeling up to it. Let's say there was a committee hearing scheduled and we really wanted to go. Okay, that's all right. You can't go that day. You can still interact with those committee members prior to the hearing. So because Facebook has access to the largest online network of Americans, you'll want to strongly consider utilizing this site as a means to advocate for people living with various chronic conditions. Now, as an organization, U.S. Pain uses this platform to share a lot of meaningful articles that might interest our population. We also use it to promote upcoming events and to engage our volunteers with campaigns such as Pain Awareness Month, November, or the latest campaign that we have following the Senate Health Committee hearing. So let's look at how you or affiliated nonprofit groups can make the most of Facebook. 
So your page or profile can serve as a few things. One, it can serve as the digital face of an organization or a movement. Personal accounts, of course, can include posts from either organizations or businesses that you like. For example, you can increase the message that's being shared by US Paint or other nonprofits just by simply sharing that post, like the one here on the right side of the slide. Now, by being on Facebook, you're also being part of the largest online network of Americans, as I stated. So just think of how many lawmakers and fellow advocates you can interact with just by joining or becoming more engaged on Facebook. Next, Facebook allows you to tag policymakers as well as reporters and other organizations. Now, in a moment, I'll show you some scenarios where you'll be able to tell if you're actually tagging an appropriate legislator and if they even have a Facebook account. So this platform also allows you to connect with other nonprofit groups, support pages, fellow advocates, and legislators to partake in an advocacy campaign. Now, for those with Facebook experience already, I'm sure that you've seen that you get an increase in likes and shares when you're using multimedia, such as an infographic, a video, or a picture relating to an advocacy call to action, or even relating to, let's say, a vacation that you recently took. People respond to photos. Now, finally, you can use social media outlets like Facebook to amplify your voice. How do you do that? By politely commenting on posts, by sharing the posts of fellow advocates or organizations, and by liking posts that are relevant to the pain community. All right, so remember I said I was going to show you how you can tag policymakers and make sure that you're actually doing it right. So here I want you to see that this act may take a little bit of practice because not every politician is on Facebook. If they are, some have chosen to use their full name and others are using their political title with their name. So you might have to go through a bit of trial and error before effectively tagging your target lawmaker. So let me start with my Facebook fail. Here you'll see I was trying to write a nice post giving thanks to US Senator Lamar Alexander. So I thought to tag the Senator, I would just use the at symbol and start typing in his name, Lamar Alexander. But Facebook got really angry with me because they didn't provide me with a little drop down box underneath his name here. So that tells me that there is no Facebook account or person by this exact name, Lamar Alexander, even though I know that is the Senator's first and last name. So then I went back to the drawing board. Now here I decided to use the at symbol again, but then I typed in Senator followed by his first name, Lamar. And you'll see immediately Facebook gave me this drop down box right here. And I can tell that it was the actual page of the Senator because of this small little check box or check mark that you'll see next to his name. So if I were to click on that drop down menu with the Senator's image on it, Facebook would complete this tag for me and it would read at Senator Lamar Alexander. So that's how to properly tag someone in a nutshell on Facebook. I'm going to put up a slide now with some helpful tips for you when tagging these legislators on Facebook. All right, the first tip is to remember, not all legislators use the same name or congruent name style on Facebook. And that goes for Twitter too. So what do I mean by that? So again, some are going to use their title and their full name and others may not want to use their title or they use their title and just their last name. And of course, there are politicians who simply go by their first and last name. I know that might be a little confusing for all of you, but here's some examples of um, some policymakers that I looked up on Facebook and how they decided to set up their profile account. All right, Senator Chris Murphy. He is at Senator Chris Murphy. So he used his title, first and last name. But Senator Mitt Romney wants to go by at Senator Romney. So don't feel discouraged if, if you're you know trying to type in a few things and you're not seeing check uh, this box here. Um, but if you are seeing a drop box, some have personal accounts and some have their political or professional account. And the one that has the most, like 9.7 million followers or likes, are going to have this little check box here. That's a good indication that you are actually tagging the appropriate person. Congressman Jim Langevin went by Congressman Jim and then last name Langevin. And then Joe Courtney is just Joe Courtney. So these are a few different examples of what I mean when I say that not everyone's using the same style on, on Facebook. So a simple way to check who's on Facebook is to visit the lawmaker's actual homepage. 
So these days, almost all of them have links to their social media profiles. So before this presentation, I actually typed in uh, Senator Susan Collins and I was able to go to her homepage, which you'll see right here. And then to the right, you'll see that there's a Facebook and Twitter icons, as well as Instagram and YouTube. Now, if I were to click on any of these options, it would take me directly to her profile page. So if I were to click right here on this Facebook icon, it would take me to her actual Facebook page. And I can see here her profile picture to the left. And underneath that, you'll see her Facebook username at Susan Collins. So that's what you would use if you wanted to tag Senator Collins on Facebook. If you're already logged into Facebook and you want to try conducting a general search for a particular lawmaker and for whatever reason, you know, maybe you're strapped for time, but you really want to engage in an issue and you can't check the home page, you can consider using the search bar located on the top left of your Facebook screen. And you'll see that if you were to type in U.S. Senator Susan Collins, it would take you to her appropriate Facebook page here. All right, let's transition now over to Twitter. Now, this is quickly rising as a place where legislative aides or policymakers are looking at when they're trying to gauge where constituents are on an issue. You'll notice that, like Facebook, Twitter is offering some live, instant, and public communication, but it's only allowing a certain amount of characters or letters that you can use in each post, or as we call it on Twitter, a tweet. So here's a tweet that I tried to do before the presentation. And I was trying to amplify a message about an advocacy opportunity, but I went past that 280 character marker. So anything that you'll see here in the red, that's not going to be posted. And so that's something for you to keep in mind if and when um, you sign up on Twitter, uh, that you need to stay within that 120 character requirement. Now, this isn't a terrible characteristic of Twitter because it's actually forcing all of us to have more short, concise, and to the point messaging. And that's actually perfect for legislative aides and lawmakers who are on the go. And they may actually gravitate to posts that are shorter and easier for them to comprehend or to read um, on their way from one building to the next. Again, many of these bullet points on this slide are going to be similar to the Facebook one, but this platform has a few tricks of its own. For example, you can tweet directly at the lawmakers through the mention option. Now, mention is similar to tagging someone on Facebook, and I'll show you how to mention someone in a moment. You should also try to use relevant hashtags for conversation tracking when you're on Twitter and can help build our voices by replying, retweeting, and liking the posts of others. I'll also discuss what a hashtag is soon, but first let me show you the anatomy of a tweet. For some reason, I don't know why this always brings me back to 10th grade bio when I hear the word anatomy. All right, here's what a tweet looks like. The tweet anatomy itself is actually pretty straightforward. You'll see right here, the person or organization's handle is what we call it with the at sign is at the top in the center there. And then to the right of that, you'll see that we used a hashtag that relates to the specific issue that this tweet was talking about. Again, I'm going to break down hashtags for you after we wrap up this anatomy lesson, so don't fret. All right, you'll see an effective tweet. We'll actually mention lawmakers, and you can mention them within the tweet itself, or you can mention them at the end of the tweet like we decided to do on this particular post. So note that you still will have to use the at symbol to mention a person. And again, when I say the word mention, think of it as tagging someone like you would on Facebook. Now, when you mention a lawmaker on Twitter, he or she will receive a notification from this platform saying that your post is containing something that may be of relevance to them. On the bottom of this tweet, you're going to see some cute little signs here. The heart tells you how many people liked your tweet. These revolving arrows right here um, tells you how many people have decided to retweet, which is the same as sharing on Facebook. And then this little chat bubble is going to tell you how many people have actually responded to your tweet. And I know I mentioned this one breaking down uh, the Facebook platform. On Twitter though, using an image is also extremely effective. 
Now, the images that you take or make on your own or images from social media campaigns that we create for you to share should always be telling a story and make someone inclined to stop, you know, uh, scrolling through their Twitter feed um, and read what you actually posted. And then circling back at the top here, you'll see the organization or your personal profile picture that's on the top left of all of your tweets. And we've used the campaign hashtag that will help track how many others are paying attention to this issue. Um, it mentions specific lawmakers with their handles. And again, it's showing us how many people liked this particular post, retweeted, and commented on it. All right, anytime I can use a cute bird that's wearing glasses and a top hat, I'm going to take full advantage of that opportunity. So that's why you'll see on your screen here an adorable blue bird, and it's telling you that a hashtag, which uses that pound sign or the number symbol, is used to mark keywords or topics in a tweet. But for our patient advocacy purposes, we're going to be using this hashtag to leverage engagement on a particular issue. Now, all of your tweets should have at least one hashtag. And the statistic on this slide is a great example as to why. One hashtag could mean a 12% increase in your engagement when compared to a tweet that you posted. That does not include a hashtag. Now, on Twitter, anyone can create a hashtag. And having a hashtag when posting is one of the more effective ways of organizing information on Twitter. Some people have used hashtags to gain attention on silly topics, um, to be you know, humorous or, or satire or um, sarcastic. And then others are using hashtags for more serious messaging. Next, a hashtag will make it easier for you as the advocate and others, including lawmakers, to find, follow, and contribute to the conversations and topics that are mattering most to you and to them. And finally, the purpose of using a hashtag in your tweet is to gain the ability to network with patient advocacy groups, as well as fellow advocates who are engaged in similar issues that you are. Now, when you're ready to create your first tweet, or maybe one that's relevant to a patient topic impacting children and adults with chronic conditions, you wanna consider a few things. The first is your tone. Now, hashtag creates a voice for you, and being aware of that's going to really help you determine when and where to include your hashtag within your tweet. Now, while you can use multiple hashtags in one tweet, I recommend using maybe one to three. If you're supporting a specific bill that will promote access to therapy options, for example, you may wanna use hashtags like the one here on the screen, patient access, chronic pain, the actual health bill of, of a piece of legislation back from 2018. Now here are some tips to consider anytime that you're going to use a hashtag. Make the hashtag fit organically within your message. And if it's not going to really fit, just include it at the end of your tweet. So um, I put an example of what I mean by including the hashtag organically within your post here. Um, relating to chronic pain. So a conversation about hashtag chronic pain is long overdue, encourage lawmakers, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you'll see it made sense. I didn't try to force chronic pain into that message. It just, it just worked. And don't use spaces or the space bar. So um, when you are using a hashtag, you need to actually merge words together. So you'll see here, if I don't merge chronic and pain as one word, even though we know it's two separate words, it's only going to make the word chronic the actual hashtag instead of chronic pain. So just be aware of that. You'll, you'll know um, Twitter is going to tell you, oh, you want this to be a hashtag because they made the word chronic blue and they made the rest of the text just plain and black. All right, when using a hashtag to join a conversation about a topic that interests you, you wanna make sure that your hashtag is relevant to the topic. So ask yourself, am I being too vague by this? Is, is, does this actually have anything to do with patient barriers? Um, and you don't wanna have more hashtags than words or use the same hashtag twice. And for example, if you're interested in patient access issues, instead of saying patient access, you might want to use step therapy, prior authorization. And right here, I gave you the example of not using the same one twice. 
you're actually taking up characters when you say it twice. So if you already said rare disease and you, you use the hashtag, there's no need to say it again. Again, try and uh, also use popular hashtags. So ones that are already being used for an advocacy campaign. I put a, a few of those there as an example. Um, patients first, care about rare, Medicare. These are all things that a lot of people are talking about. And you'll start to, when you get the hang of using Twitter, as you're typing in a hashtag, Twitter will actually try to populate what hashtag you're thinking of. And if it's a really popular one, like when I use chronic pain or um, step therapy, for example, it'll tell me underneath that hashtag how many um, other people have tweeted about that already that day. So that's also a good indicator that it's a popular hashtag if you see that a lot of other people are utilizing the same one. All right, this slide is going to be intended for those who may need a little bit more training on actually getting started with a Twitter account. Now, for those of you who are Twitter experts, I would recommend that you use this time, maybe fill up your water bottles, take a quick bathroom break, and for everybody else, please continue following along. Now, you know now that Twitter is a very fast, effective way to get your message out about an issue that's really impacting the chronic pain community. So it really makes sense to add to your advocacy toolbox by creating an account if you don't already have one. If you're still not convinced, let me just share this with you. Studies show if policymakers receive about 30 tweets on a bill, it's almost guaranteed to receive support from that individual. And 71% of congressional staffers say the more people affiliated with a specific group or cause who respond to a legislator's post, the more likely they'll have some or a lot of influence on that lawmaker's decision. So you see, you have the power without even leaving your home to directly advocate to lawmakers in a very public way, adding accountability to their actions. But I wanna be honest, in order for us to be successful, we do need tweets from individuals who are being represented by state and federal lawmakers. So in other words, your social media posts are going to have the most direct impact on a way that an elected official will make a decision. Is your mind blown yet? Mine too. So let's get you started on Twitter. The first thing you'll need to do is visit twitter.com, find the sign up box, or you can go to twitter.com backslash sign up, and it will take you to a screen like this. So you're going to enter your full name, you'll enter your phone number, you can also enter your email instead if that works for you. Whatever information Twitter is asking at the time, please fill it in. And then you're going to click sign up for Twitter. Next, you're going to be asked to choose a profile name or a username. So ideally, it's your full name or a part of it. And just keep in mind, your username is one that your followers will use when sending replies, mentions, and direct messages. So this is also the name lawmakers are going to see. You can change your username in your account settings at any time, as long as a new username is not already in use. So maybe you thought something at the time was really cute, and now you're like, well, I'm doing a lot more advocacy. I want policymakers to take me seriously. I'm just going to put in my first and last name or my first and last name and include advocate somewhere in there or maybe my state in there, that, that's probably a safe bet. I will say though, if you're going to keep changing your username a lot, it, you might end up losing your credibility and people will have a hard time finding you. So I recommend choose a username and stick to it. Once you choose a username, you're going to have to choose your profile picture. And for today's training, we're gonna use this lovable image of the character Michael Scott from The Office as played by Steve Carell because I am a diehard Office fan. So while I was hoping to get a small smile out of all of you by using this image, there are some legitimate reasons why a photo like this one could actually work on your Twitter account. Um, in all seriousness though, you'll wanna actually choose an image of you and not an image of a celebrity. So why a photo of you instead of a brand name, a logo, clip art, or some random image of your favorite pair of socks that you're wearing? Well, because people are going to want to talk to a real person and not a brand. And also keep in mind that whatever image you choose is going to be seen every time that you tweet. So with that, your profile picture should be one that allows us to clearly see your face. Avoid images where your eyes are closed or photos that your friends have taken where you are mid-sneeze. 
Now, your attire doesn't have to be a business professional, but if you are an active advocate who testifies or attends local government meetings, you may want to be wearing something business casual. In the end, try to wear something that is appropriate. But at the end of the day, this is your image. It's okay if it's a little quirky or if it stands out and it really sets you apart like everybody else. For example, if you really are the world's best boss. All right, once you choose your picture, like Facebook, you will also have the ability and option to create a bio on Twitter. Now, this is very important that you take a little bit of time when writing your bio, because this is usually the first thing that people are going to see when deciding whether or not they want to follow you. And they're going to use that bio to determine if you are a reputable advocate. So in other words, you're going to be judged by what you write in your bio. And I have seen people change their bio a few times, tweak it so that way it really is one that's speaking to the type of person or individual that they are. Now you're only going to have about 160 characters to tell the entire world, including lawmakers, everything that they need to know about you as a person. So you're going to want to make your bio inviting, but also interesting. Now using keywords is going to help your targeted audience find you. So if you're a migraine blogger, for example, you might wanna actually say that in your bio instead of just blogger or writer. If you work part-time, full-time, or volunteer when you're able, maybe you wanna tell your audience what you do specifically. You can include that Twitter handle of the company or the nonprofit organizations that you volunteer for in your bio. Also make sure to include your location in your profile. Now this is really going to validate to the lawmakers you're tagging that you are in fact their constituent. And once you've completed the basic sign-up steps, you're ready to follow people. So we're going to choose people who will likely take an interest in what you're doing, those who are affiliated with causes that you support and who may offer some news or events that will impact you as a person living with pain. I wanted to show this screen here because once your profile is set up, you'll see the profile picture right here. It may ask you for a second picture. Um, I believe you have the option to do that later or to choose kind of like a cover photo on Facebook. You have the same option on Twitter. Here's where um, my name is going to show up or your name will show up. Uh, this will be your Twitter handle is what it's called, the at sign and then your name. Uh, notice we have the underscore. You can use the underscore in your name. So if someone already has your name, like Shana Smith, I can do Shana underscore Smith or Shana Smith 2. Uh, a few different, you know, combinations. Find one that's that's going to speak to the type of individual that you are. And then this is our bio. So this is where your bio will live once you go to your homepage of Twitter. And then you'll see here how many tweets you have, how many people are following you. How many, uh, how many people you're following rather, how many followers you have and um, other metrics such as that. Okay, so I wanted to give you some examples of some social media tweets that we have done. Here you'll see how USP decided to utilize Twitter to push legislation, House Bill 4146 in Illinois across the finish line. So we took advantage of Twitter to help get a Chicago Tribune story circulated among other nonprofits and, and healthcare professional groups and medical societies, as well as advocates living right in Illinois. And the efforts of coalition members and advocates in Illinois actually led this legislation to turn into law and it became effective on January 1st of this year. This is another example. This is a call to action tweet that grabbed the attention of our followers. Now this one tweet actually yielded 1,536 impressions. For those of you who don't know, an impression means the number of times that a tweet showed up in someone's timeline. Now every time someone retweets this or creates their own tweet with a link to this online engagement, we're increasing our reach across the country and ultimately uniting our voices as individuals who collectively live with a chronic condition. Just as an aside, I'm super proud of um, this effort. To, uh, we have had several online campaigns um, over the years. I know we have at least five going on right now. Um, if you visit our advocacy section, social media has really contributed to garnering a lot of the advocates uh, participating in the online engagements that we have. So for this one in particular, we had about 380 plus advocates submit nearly 600 letters to senators in just five days. Now, there are some rules for you to store away. And when you're feeling overwhelmed about social media, 
Take out these rules, breathe in deeply, then breathe out deeply and follow these instructions. The first rule is please don't stress out about whether you think you're doing um, posting or tweeting correctly. Advocacy is going to take practice, as you all know, and we are here to help. So if you have a question, you wanna run something by us, just shoot me an email. But just remember, this is really supposed to be an exciting activity for you to partake in. Also take advantage of any sample posts or toolkits that we're going to send your way. So typically I send all of these toolkits via email to those state specific advocates who may be impacted in some way on a piece of proposed legislation that we're talking about. So if we have a federal social media campaign, then of course we're going to send sample posts out to all of our volunteers. So it's not state specific. If you're not feeling especially clever or computer savvy on a day that you wanted to engage on social media or advocacy purposes, just keep in mind you always do have the option to simply share or retweet a post or to tweet um, anything that's written by U.S. Pain Foundation. And this is helpful towards our advocacy cause too because you're sharing the message to your networks who may not be our friends yet on social media. Also, I put on there to remember to use the at symbol, which reminds me for some reason of a pig snout for whatever reason, but uh, you wanna use the at sign when you're mentioning decision makers on Facebook or on Twitter. And finally, make sure to mention the bill number and or the name of that bill and any hashtags that might be going along with that specific bill. So I didn't put this bullet point up on the slide, but I think it goes without saying that finally, as a rule, please be courteous, respectful, and polite anytime you're tagging or mentioning a lawmaker or anytime that you're engaging in a post or a tweet from a fellow advocate. I know sometimes we all get frustrated with healthcare barriers and we don't really have anyone to turn to. And sometimes when we have a flare up of some kind, it can make us just a little grumpy. Like I get a case of the grumpies every once in a while. But rather than coming at an elected official with anger, present solutions. So how you address an issue and a person, remember, is really going to go a long way on your advocacy journey. You might be asking yourself now, how do I get involved? So as soon as we end this webinar on social media, there are a few different ways you can do so. If you haven't already, please connect with us both on Facebook and Twitter. We're also on Instagram, YouTube, and a couple other pages. And once you follow or like us, you'll be able to get some real-time notifications as well as some updates that are important to you as a person living with chronic pain. And you can also share, retweet, and quote our posts. That would be greatly appreciated. For those of you who um, may not be receiving them yet, if you did not sign up, sign up to become an advocate, um, but you're interested in doing so, our advocacy email alerts that we send out always has our social media links at the bottom. And sometimes we include some sample posts, as I mentioned, that you can easily just copy and paste onto your Facebook timeline or as a tweet on Twitter. All right, I know I went through a lot of information in such a short amount of time. I'm actually surprised that I didn't go over, um, but I wanted to take this opportunity to see if any of you had questions relating to using social media or if there's anything I haven't gone over specifically that, that you think would be helpful for you. All right, so let's see. So someone asked, um, how does U.S. pain overcome issues of fake news, especially in regards to raising awareness of symptoms which are not always recognized by healthcare professionals? It seems to be very easy to disregard posts that we don't like, um, that we don't like and brand them as fake news. So um, that's, that's a good question, Ruth. You know, I think a lot of the times the um, articles that we are sharing are coming from reputable sources that we have collaborated with over the years. Um, we also try and utilize a lot of platforms that include writers who have chronic pain conditions themselves. So it's actually a lot more credible coming from um, the patient perspective, if you will, than just coming from um, a reporter who has decided um, to interview a, a specific type of um, patient. 
Okay, someone else. Is it 180 or 280 characters? That's from Ernie. Thank you, Ernie, for asking that. So a little while ago, Twitter actually increased the number of characters. It used to be 140. Um, a lot of people still try and keep it, you know, around that 140 mark just because they have um, seen how impactful short messaging can actually have. But I'm so sorry about that. I just realized I forgot to turn off or unplug my um, my phone. So now you can use 100, um, I'm sorry, 280 characters. Again, that being said, just try and keep it short and simple. I think that that's really the best rule that I can offer. Uh, does it matter if a letter is capitalized or not? From Michelle, oh, when you're using a hashtag. So for example, hashtag capital C for chronic, hashtag P for pain versus chronic pain versus chronic pain. Okay, so that's a great question, Michelle. Um, rule of thumb, I, what I have done um, is I you it'll still show up as a hashtag whether you capitalize letters of uh, of a word or not. But for me, for some reason, my eyes actually are able to break down the phrasing in a hashtag easier if each new word has its own capital letter. Um, but it's it's not mandatory that you know there's there's no specific rule. I've seen it done um, a few different ways where people are using capital letters as well as lowercase. Um, I don't think that one is more popular over another. Um, what I will say is that a lot of people will capitalize or use capitals if they are if they are, um, you know, maybe referencing like National Institutes of Health, hashtag NIH. All of those are in cap, in cap blocks instead of lowercase n, lowercase i, lowercase h. Um, let's see. What are the actual mechanics of tweeting an article? So not retweeting, but something that you've read, for example. Okay, that's a great question. That comes from Julie. I'm glad you asked that. Nowadays, if you are reading an article online, you'll see almost always somewhere on the top, whether it's top right, top left, or the center, there's going to be um, an icon, that Twitter icon, which is the little bird. If you were to click on that little bird, it would automatically allow you to share the article that you were reading to your Twitter account. Obviously, this won't work if you don't have a Twitter account. So set one up first, and then you can do that. Another way that you could share an article is to simply copy the entire um, website address where that article is. And after you copy it, you could paste it. But I think the easiest way is to just utilize the buttons that are already going to be found in most cases in an article. Okay, let's see. Someone's across posting. I'm not. Mike, if you want to expand on that, that would be great. Oh, okay, you did. Uh, I'll get to that in one second. Can you mail the toolkit from Heather? Um, so we don't, you mean by uh, regular mail and not email, Heather, if that's what you're referring to, we do not email, we do not send out by mail our actual social media toolkits because they're always changing. And a lot of times what you'll see in this advocacy space is that things happen and move quickly. I'll give you an example here in Rhode Island, we might get notified of a hearing tomorrow, today, whereas some other states, they'll give you notice of a hearing a week and a half in advance, and that gives you some time to create social media posts and share them with advocates. So one of the reasons why we do it by email is it's it's really quick and effective. Can you talk about Instagram in advocacy? Facebook and Twitter are the common outlets, but Instagram is good for infographics, et cetera. And that's from Kathy. Yes, thank you, Kathy. So a lot of politicians are creating Instagram accounts now. Um, they're finding it particularly trendy with the younger generations to go live on Instagram. And a lot of people are watching them live or they're posting their videos or images of an event that they attended. I would say it's just, you know, it's effective to definitely think about using Instagram when you are um, trying to advocate for, for a particular bill or issue. There are a few ways that you can do that, I would say, which is similar to how you could do it, I guess, on Facebook or Twitter in that if a congressman has recently posted something on Instagram, you could comment or reply to that Instagram photo or video with an ask or a call to action. Or if you have your own image or you wanna use an image that we shared with you for, um, you know, in a social media toolkit for Twitter or Facebook, 
you can easily use that same image and, and use it on Instagram. Just keep in mind that the handles may not be the same for that politician when you are going from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram. Um, we also use a, a, a social media platform that allows us to cross post from, from one platform to the next. Um, Sprout Social is one of them. There are a few that are out there. So you might wanna take a look at doing, at doing that. Again, what we run into is when you wanna mention a politician, um, their Twitter handle or, or Instagram handle may differ. Is there a way to tag politicians and organizations on Instagram? Yes. So uh, that comes from Angelica. Thank you so much for asking that. Just like Twitter and Facebook, some politicians and organizations are on Instagram and some are not. The easiest way is for you to be in Instagram and then you're going to click on that little spyglass um, where you can search and just try searching for a specific lawmaker or a specific organization. Where do I get information about pending bills from Nancy? Okay, this is another great question. So currently you can go to uspainfoundation.org backslash advocacy, and you can look up key issues by state or by the issue itself. I will say that we will be transitioning our platform shortly, but you will still be able to look up legislation that's being proposed in your state. Another uh, great way to get information is by signing up to our newsletter, which will sometimes have advocacy alerts in there. And if you are an ambassador but didn't sign up as an advocate, um, sign up as an advocate and as bills um, that we are focused on are coming into play, you're going to receive a, a specific email alert about how you can get involved with that piece of legislation. I know Instagram can cross post to Facebook. Any other any others or apps to make it easier? And that's from Mike. Again, yes, there are others. Um, we we as an organization use Sprite, so uh, Sprout Social, I should say. Um, but there are there are some others out there. It really just depends on if you want one that's for free, if you want one without ads, um, if you're using it on your phone versus on your computer. Because sometimes some apps look a little wonky when you're trying to use your cell phone versus when you can actually sit in front of your laptop. So I would just say. Um, do a little bit of investigating and find one that's going to work for you in order to cross post. Would you talk about linking advocacy blogs to social media? And that comes from Kathy. So Kathy, I think, are you referring to, if you are a blogger and you wanna link your blog to social media, um, there are a few different ways that you can do that. I know on um, Facebook and Twitter, for example, when you go to set up your bio or your profile, it will ask you um, if you have any affiliated websites and that would be the perfect place for you to link in your um, bio. I think I did show also on the screen um, for the US Pain Twitter account, you, you may have seen underneath explaining what US Pain is. There was a little hyperlink there. Um, you can also include a small shortened hyperlink by using tiny URL or um, Bitly, for example, if you want people to click on your blog or someone else's blog. Um, I do not have printer access, so a print slash paper copy. Okay, that was from Heather, sorry. She was um, asking about the social media toolkit. So um, Heather, when we send a social media toolkit or sample posts, we are usually doing it through our constant contact email program. And right in that message, you can just easily um, copy and then paste it into your Facebook or uh, Twitter timeline and post or tweet it. Um, if you don't know how to copy and, and paste something, um, just reach out to me offline and I'm sure I can find something uh, for you to uh, help you go through that. So as a writer, do op-ed articles work? That comes from Linda. Oh, okay, when you're talking, uh, so Linda, I, I think I understand if you're referring to advocacy initiatives, I would say, yes, it probably depends on the circulation of that media outlet that you are utilizing. But I will say too that if you, and this is a gentle reminder for everyone, if you are going to be writing an op-ed article and you're going to be signing as a US pain volunteer, so either an advocate or ambassador, um, just let us know first of what you're planning on doing. So that way US pains, um, 
communications department can give you the green light as to whether or not you know it's fine for you to use your title or if they'd rather that you just um, submit something as a person living with chronic pain. But it also lets us know what our volunteers are doing and we would love to be able to highlight those op-eds and help it gain some more traction if it's something really relevant to a particular piece of legislation at the state or federal level. Um, Sherry asked if this information is available for us to see later. This was so much information in a quick manner. I need to see it again. I'm so sorry, Sherry. I really will try to um, go slower for one. Yes, the information will be available. Um, all of our webinars are recorded. So if many of you went to uspainfoundation.org backslash webinars, our recordings live there. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email thanking you for joining today, and I will make sure that it includes a recording link, and you can watch this presentation again anytime. Lori wants to know if it's possible to secure a copy of my slides for future or personal reference. Um, thanks, Lori. So right now we are just... Um, making the presentations available through our recordings and we aren't sharing the slides. Um, but certainly if there's something in particular that you think might be helpful for other advocates, we can look at maybe creating a one pager, um, sort of like a cheat sheet for um, social media. And that's actually something that, that I should consider doing for all of you anyway. So thank you for bringing that up. Heather says that they submitted items to be credited towards becoming an advocate. They haven't heard back from anyone. Okay, so Heather, send me an email offline and I'll make sure that we get you all squared away and that you have all of the materials that you need. Jenny says she'll be getting uh, onto Facebook for the first time. So how does she join for that purpose? Do I use my name from Jenny at Payne? Okay. So if you, um, Jenny, if you're talking about creating a Facebook account for the first time, you're going to see actually a lot of a lot of similarities between Facebook and Twitter. They're going to ask you for you know your username. Um, you're going to log in with your email address or phone number and uh, a password, so everything's password protected. And the same thing uh, you'll want to consider when setting up your Facebook account, um, you know, with the profile picture and, and the cover photos. Um, I can take a look and see if there's a really easy breakdown how to guide for you on Facebook if you want to send me an email offline and I can try and get that information for you. Okay, thank you. What about your regular pain advocacy toolkit in print? Okay, so we current I will double check to see if this, I don't think this toolkit comes to our advocates when they first sign up and you guys receive that welcome package. You, you may though, um, it's available online and is available for print, but I know you said that you don't have a printer, Heather. Um, send me an email offline about this. I can see if I can get it printed for you or, you know, I, I know it's probably going to cost some money, but um, a lot of um, community centers or libraries will have um, printer accessibility for you if there's something specific that you wanted to print out. Okay, Roberta wants to know, could I please elaborate on what would make a bio more serious, notable for a pain patient who is mostly at home? Okay, so Roberta, you're going to want to use some of the keywords that you actually just um, described to me, but you know, I think the important the important message I would I would say is to um, keep in mind that sometimes labeling ourselves as pain patients is um, or can have some negative um, connotations or negative light, although that's completely what what we are. Um, you know, consider maybe pain warrior or patient advocate seeking or, or you know, what 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 are you doing on Twitter? First of all, if that's something that you want to mention, um, you you might uh, want to if you're looking for it to be something serious, you're you're not going to want to use, you know, quirky words, symbols, slang. Um, you're going to just want to keep it business professional. Um, I was actually doing a little bit of research to see what would be considered some serious bios. And there's a lot of good examples out there um, if you just want to, you know, Google it and see and, and use um that as a as a reference if you're trying to be a business professional but if you're a pain patient who's mostly at home you know you, i mean you might just you, you may want to say that that I, I don't i don't think that there's anything you know completely wrong with just saying that you're, you're mostly at home or um you know i think that the important thing is to maybe try and put a positive spin 
responded at the end. If you want to shoot me an email and send me something like what you're thinking about, I, I'm happy to to um, to tweak the wording with you and, and work with you. Um, someone says that they can go back and review the recording. Oh, Roberta says she goes by Bobby. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anybody else have some questions or want me to go through? I was thinking one thing that might be helpful for you is if I actually went into Twitter and showed you a little bit about hashtags. Is that something that would be helpful to anyone? Just uh, let me know as a question. Someone's, oh, Heather, thank you for emailing, for going to email me. This is my email, by the way, Shana, at uspainfoundation.org. Um, if you forget it, it's in our advocacy section. It's usually on a lot of the email alerts that you might get pertaining to state-specific advocacy initiatives. Okay, uh, Bobby, sure, you would like me to go into Twitter and show you guys about hashtags. Is anybody else interested in, in learning about hashtags? And I will say, I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but a lot of the Twitter chats that you guys see, and maybe you're like, I don't know how to Twitter chat or get engaged in that. Um, they're used by using a hashtag. So it's relatively simple um, once you get the hang of it. So I will pause there and see if anyone wants to. Okay, Faye, perhaps you want to have one Twitter account for your chronic pain account and another for your business. Is that possible? And um, that comes from Faye. Yes, um, it, it is possible. Some I've seen a few of my advocacy colleagues do that, um, saying that this is their personal account or it's their professional account. So you are able to do that. Just make sure that when you're switching from one account to the next, that you're being... Um, that you're well aware of which account you're posting to. So you may want to have two separate profile pictures when toggling from one Twitter account to the next so that way you don't accidentally post something that's personal on your professional patient advocacy account. Okay. Oh, Jenny, um, she doesn't want a Facebook account, just connect with friends. How do I make it specific for this organization? Um, Jenny, I'm not 100% clear if you want to connect with friends from U.S. Pain Foundation um, or fellow advocates. A lot of them um, have followed us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, Facebook, we actually have a volunteer site, and then we also have the main U.S. Pain Foundation website. Michelle, thank you for the great information. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us today. Um, I think I will just quickly take a moment here. I'll still get your questions. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. There are two Heathers. Yes. Okay. Both Heathers. <laughs> Send me an email offline and I'll get you squared away. Thank you. All right. Let me uh, take a moment here to show you real quickly. All right. So once you create a Twitter account, you can search Twitter for hashtags. Um, you can use these hashtags to engage in conversations, to join a Twitter chat, and I will show you one. Let's see. So when I use the hashtag November, which is one of our online campaigns, it takes you automatically to the top here, I'm going to increase this for everybody. It takes you to the top hashtags. Um, I think that usually means like the most engagements. Uh, the latest are going to be uh, in order, you know, time. Uh, so when it was actually posted. So the latest, so the last time somebody decided to use November as a hashtag was December 20th of 2018. Before that, it was us on December 17th, 2018. November, if there was a person associated with November, those would show up here. Um, I will say if you're joining a Twitter chat, you're going to click on latest. So that way the news feed is coming in timely. Um, let me show you an example. Let's see if we can go to US Pain. What's the latest? Okay, so the latest is actually from me. Hashtag US pain, and that was on February 16th. Now, if I were as an organization to type in something saying, thanks so much for those who joined today's webinar, 
hashtag US pain, you will see momentarily that Twitter will tell me that there is a latest post it should say something like one one new post um, if it's not because it, there is a little bit of a delay sometimes you can just click on latest again and it's almost like um, hitting refresh and now you'll see thanks you'll see the us pain hashtag so that's um how you can search for you know either if people are if you want to engage in a twitter chat and there's a specific hashtag people are using if you want to engage in a conversation about something, let's say you want to see what's happening in the world of hashtag chronic pain, you can hit top or you can hit latest and it'll show you. And then you can decide if you want to engage in some of these posts, if you want to like some of those posts. So there's a lot that you can do with hashtags. It really allows you to just be a little bit more organized um, with um, you know, different issues that are impacting us as a chronic pain community. Uh, did anyone else have questions about Twitter while we're while I'm on this account? Oh look, somebody else just added. Oh, sorry, that wasn't about US pain. <laughs> I got really excited for a second there. All right, let me uh go back to this. So somebody has, someone was raising their hand. Did someone have a question? Okay, I think that their hands were raised for a little while. All right, great. Well, um, if there aren't any more questions, I will conclude this afternoon's training session because we actually are just a few minutes past the one hour mark. I want to thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. I also wanna thank our sponsor, Eli Lilly, for making today's advocacy webinar presentation possible. Both US Pain and Eli Lilly recognize that patient education is the first step in helping promote positive change, not only at the policy level, but also within one's own health journey. Do be on the lookout for your follow-up email from us that will include the recorded link from today's presentation. And I encourage you all, once you um, end this, once we end this webinar, to start engaging more on Facebook and Twitter. If you create a new Twitter account today and you want to start um, maybe using a hashtag or two and seeing if you're doing it right. I'm happy to take a look at that. If you guys want to use the hashtag US pain, um, for example, hashtag, I, I, I can search that later and see how many of you um, actually tweeted something today. Thank you so much again, and I hope you have a low pain rest of your afternoon.